Greetings everyone. My name is Matt Houston and today we're going to discuss um, some very important issues that involves voting, that involves the state of black America, um, but most importantly we're going to discuss uh, issues and, and things of that nature so that we can build as a community together. And today we have an esteemed panel uh, both in person and virtually um, that will discuss several issues um, that is relating to the importance of, of survival in 2020 and beyond, um, not only through our health um, during this pandemic, but also um, for our civil liberties. Um, as you know, um, we have in, our, in America, um, the world has witnessed for the last several months an intense um, um, an intense space where blacks uh, are, are, are being attacked um, and, and that um, there's civil unrest that is, 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 is definitely um, challenging the face of our society. So we have um, several groups of people in this area who are leaders, not only in our community, but also in their professions. And what I would like to do is to have each panelist introduce themselves, starting with my right. Hello, everyone. My name is Cora Black. Um, I am an HR professional by day, but every other hour of my time is towards political activism. I am the newly elected president of Dallas County Young Democrats. I like to bring the voice of young people and also to activate young voices and young people. So I'm very excited for this conversation and hope that you all uh, have some sort of actionable takeaways from today. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Deborah Dennis, and I am hosting this event this evening uh, in my living room. And the purpose of this event is to reach out to the young uh, black adults and impress upon them the value of their votes and discuss some issues that affect the vote this year and um, to discuss more importantly why they should vote, why we need your vote, and what we have to lose if you don't vote. So with that, I move to my esteemed colleague on the uh, right. Actually, Cranston and I are both are realtors, and he's the broker, and I work under him. Cool. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Cranston Akibalon, and by trade, um, I'm a real estate broker. Real estate is, is what I do. Uh, it's what I love. I've been in the business for a while. And in looking at real estate and seeing how things progress, you see the importance of the political system. You see the importance of the economic system. You see the importance of the criminal justice system. So with all of these different things, our vote definitely makes an impact on those things. And so what I wanted to do is come out today to be able to speak to the youth. Me, I'm, I'm no longer the youth. I remember when I was the youth when I came here to Dallas. I went to a university a few miles, 100 uh, miles south of here, Prairie View and University. And uh, I was the youth and I was 20 something. And so I was young, raring to go. Um, now I'm in my 40s. And so what I consider myself as a somewhat of a middle aged mentor. So I'm looking to be able to make sure that those that are coming behind us can not fall into some of the pitfalls that we fell into and be able to move things forward. And so our vote is definitely important. Many of our ancestors and our people died for the right to be able to vote. And to me, it's a sad reality sometimes when we see the percentage of people that actually come in to vote versus when you look at other countries, it's, it's mandatory that you must vote. But here, it's a choice. So we want to make sure that we help you all make that choice to be able to get out, cast your vote, be informed about the issues and be able to speak. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of the movement. I do want to introduce our virtual panelist, who is the executive director of Four Oak Cliff, Mr. Taylor Toins. Taylor, how are you doing, sir? I'm 
I'm blessed. Thank y'all for having me. Thank you. Thank you. you. We can hear you. Would you mind introducing yourself? Tell us a little bit about what you do, very briefly. Yeah, uh, well, I'm Taylor Toy, founder, executive director of Core Oak Um Our mission is we aim to liberate Oak from systemic oppression through a culture of education, increasing social mobility and social capital, and we do so through four pillars of work, education, advocacy, community building, and the arts. And um, I'm blessed to, to uh, be sharing this space with you, Matt, um, who served as, as a mentor, big bro, and introduced me to a lot of people and, and given a lot of opportunities to space in the city to be able to do our work. So um, I think that that speaks towards the, the piece of our mission of increasing social, uh, social capital. And, and in, in the spirit of the conversation today, um, Encouraging our people to vote, encouraging our people to understand the uh, process is something that I'm really passionate about and I'm um, eager to, to chop it up and discuss with y'all today. Thank you, sir. Thank you for all the work that you do, not only as uh, director for Old Clip, but even since your undergrad years at UNT, you've always been passionate about our community and passionate for our people. So thank you. For all, thank you for making it easy for me to be your mentor because you take whatever advice I have and you take it a thousand miles. So you're doing amazing work. Lastly, I want to introduce, no problem. Lastly, I would like to introduce an amazing public servant um, who has served us in the state legislature um, in the uh, representative district 100, um, former state representative Lorraine Bearable. Lorraine, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, and I want to thank you for including me on this panel for this extremely important and timely discussion. Um, I am honored to work with the District 100 in the State House. Um, prior to doing that, I've worked at the federal, state, and local level to improve conditions for our community on a variety of issues, whether it's health care, education, and justice reform. Um, but I've also been on the battlefield of voting rights, and I'm so glad that we're going to focus on that tonight because. At the end of the day, all the things that we want for our community, um, they come from the ballot box or the current house. So we need to make sure that we are effective on those channels. Definitely, definitely. Thank you for all the work that, that you've done, that you are doing, um, because our civil liberties are, are vital um, for our survival. Now that you've heard from the panelists, I want to go over several ground rules for our, our discussion thing. Uh, we are not going to um, we're not going to repeat history from earlier this week of what we've seen from the first debate. Um, there will be no arguing. So if you all are looking for that in this channel, um, my apologies. Please go to Bravo or some other network. Um, but here we really are investing in the lives of our community, uh, specifically black Dallasites, and then so that we can impact all, all of the world. We'll be discussing three major topics. It was alluded to earlier, but it was discussed uh, vividly now. One is voting. Uh, it's very important as the November 3rd elections approach um, that we are well informed. This is our last stretch where people can register to vote. The last day of registering to vote in the state of Texas is Monday, October 5th. So we'll be discussing voting. We will also discuss uh, the pandemic. We'll discuss COVID-19 and how that has impacted our community, um, not just with elections, but also through other facets uh, of our community. And thirdly, uh, we want to discuss a branch of government that is traditionally not in the forefront, but is, but is just as vital, and that is the Supreme Court of the United States. As we know, um, uh, we've lost the legend, and, and we are now as a country in the process of uh, in trying to figure out um, what we should do um, to, to ensure our liberties from the justice and the court system to be preserved. Um, and, and we'll be discussing that. So before, um, so now that you hear that, um, I do want to state another ground rule. We have three people in person with me, and we have three virtually practicing social distancing. All of us in person, if we're talking, we have our masks off like this. 
because we are practicing safe distancing. We do want to practice as many health concerns, uh, health protocols as possible. And please, if you haven't been tested, please ensure that you know that you uh, you know your status with COVID-19, so that you won't impact negatively impact your family or elsewhere. But while we're talking, we won't have our mask on. But as we're resting, you notice our panelists will have our mask. When I'm not talking, I will put my mask on. All right. Are we ready? Re ready, panels? Let's ready. get started. Good deal. <laughs> first, first topic, we'll be discussing both. I would like to start with you, Ms. Dennis. Would you please tell me why would you want, why is voting important, and why specifically do you want to um, impart this knowledge to our young people on why voting is important? To me, it's important to me this year, <coughs> especially because having grown up in Jim Crow, I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back to that. And it frightens me uh, calling out the Proud Boys and the white supremacists and uh, the like and the, the blatant racism that comes from the, the White House and uh, his base. And we are so divided. I want to go back to Obama. I want the, the peace and the tranquility of the Obama years. And I may not have been peaceful and tranquil, but it's that feeling that I want. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I just think that in order, when Hillary ran in 2016, there was a lot of apathy and a lot of complacency. We just cannot afford that. We need every single vote out there. And for the young black Americans, uh, I just hear it in the news, on social media, talking to them when I'm walking to stores, and they just sometimes they don't think that their vote is important. Mm -hmm. And we want to tell them why it's important. Or they feel like um, what Trump is doing is, is great. It could be great. And I'm pretty sure that there's some benefits with what he's done. I'm not trying to knock his administration. What I'm trying to do is to impress upon them there is better than what's going on. Mm -hmm. And that's what, um, that's why we need their vote. And they need to become informed and they need to understand. And that is what this panel is about tonight, informing them and helping them to understand what it is they have to lose if they don't vote. That's a great point. Thank you. And thank you for doing this. Thank you for your vision. Thank you for investment, your investment in our community. You, you don't just do this um, in this state, in your lovely home here. You've been doing this work all as long as I've known you. Um, not only in civil, in, in, in the civic world, but also in the business world. Um, and ensuring that people have uh, great places to stay because that's a part of their life space. Voting is important, so thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, you brought up something that I want Taylor Toynes to kind of pick up. Um, you stated earlier that it's really our young people, our youth, uh, may not know exactly the context of where we come from as a people. Um, I'm, I was fortunate to have my father and mother um, tell me about um, poll taxes and tell me the different things that specifically the South um, have created that prevents us to exercise that liberty. Taylor, I want you to talk a little bit about um, Fort Oak Cliff and the young people that are there. Um, what are, what's the pulse? What are people in our, what are young people in our community discussing? What are their frustrations? Um, what are some things that voting can actually help provide solutions to some of the frustrations that possibly our young people are facing today? So I would, I would say that um, we have to make it very practical for our youth because this is an entirely new generation from, you know, even our, and I'm 31 years old, so this is, this is a, a, new, a new group of people, a new era, um, and making it practical. So 
just recently I had a conversation with a young man who just got registered to vote for the first time, and it'll be his first time going to the polls. And he was essentially asking me, like, why is it important? Like, you know, he was telling me no matter who the president is, things don't go change. Um, his, his parents, his parents and his brothers, I mean, his uh, close cousins can both the addict. And his, his, his uh, response to me was, no matter who the president is, my dad's still going to be an addict. And my response to him was, you know, was one, with, with understanding of where he was coming from. Um, and I let him know, you know, the president is just one position. Uh, but I gave him the understanding of the president select or appoint um, a Supreme Court justice. And then I had a conversation with him about Thurgood Marshall and how important Thurgood Marshall was to be on the Supreme Court. And he got a little bit more understanding. And then I even made it even more uh, more local to him uh, and talked to him about, you know, the district attorney. I asked him if he knew who the DA was. And he's familiar with the DA's office. He just didn't know who, who, who per se, the, who Craig Crusoe, uh, John Crusoe is. Mm -hmm. And um, I let him know about that and just told him, like, man, these are the things that, uh, that change our city. Um, these are the things that are going to change your life and your children's life when you have them. But for me, I believe it's, it's practicality. Um, and, and the other side of it, too, when we look at our elected officials, is um, who, are we, who, are we, uh, who are we going to, to to try to win a vote or try to get a voice of? And a lot of times I've heard over the past you know, couple of years, it's a lot of... Um, we want to get millennials out to vote, and now you got, what is it, Gen Z? You know, you got all these different labels that we put on people. But for me, um, I, think about, I think about those who, who are um, the most downtrodden, the people who are in the oppressed state, and <clears throat> I haven't seen too much of an effort to really go to that uh, particular group of people. When we think of, you know, apartment complexes, you know, it's about 3,000 people that live in Village Oaks apartments, but I haven't seen a real campaign take place in those apartments where people could, you know, see, touch, and feel uh, the, the candidates that are running for these offices. So I think that we really have to shift um, the audience in which we're talking to when we, when we have uh, elected officials running <laughs> and really go out and um, talk to a new group of people that, that haven't been tapped and that would be very passionate because they have all the intangible things that we need to make a movement. They just really haven't seen a lot of people that they could believe in that were in, uh, in, in proximity to them. Gotcha. You're absolutely right. And that's, and that's something that uh, you brought up. You brought up another good topic. And, and that is, uh, and I'm teeing up if Councilman Thomas and, 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 and Lorraine uh, Barable are available. I want us to talk about the importance of um, representation um, because uh, you did state something that was frustrating to most people. Most people don't understand that most politics are local and that local elected officials can directly benefit uh, or directly hinder our livelihoods in, in the city. And so, Lorraine, would you mind talking to us a little bit about uh, from from an elected position, from an elected official's position, the power of a vote and what citizens should expect from electorates uh, realistically um, compared to what is typically presented or perceived and how we can use that as a people, as a community to maximize our impact in the country. Okay, so that the phone cut out a little bit on the first part in terms of what the community should expect. I think first of all, people have uh, inverse expectations. What I mean by that is when you are a public service, you work for the community. Mm. It's not the other way around. And I do think that there are some people in positions of public trust who don't have that understanding. And so one of the things that's really important is we have people who are representing us who are really service oriented and are really doing this because there's a need um, to make these changes. 
uh, not for self-aggrandizing, frankly. Um, and so that has to be part of it. Part of service is actually demonstrating you mean what you say and you say what you mean. So, for example, uh, we're in the middle of a crisis. Um, I can say that there are people who are out there who are doing what can be done to help people. So, for example, setting up testing sites, um, helping people with unemployment benefits, making sure that people have what they need to get through this crisis, because that's what service is about. Yeah. And that is what the expectation should be. Um, is making sure that we are delivering those services that you already paid for with your tax dollars. And even if you haven't paid for it, listening to the community and seeing what the needs are and doing everything you can to implement those changes. And so that is uh, definitely part of the responsibility, but we could talk for a long time about all the responsibilities, but that's the short version. Good deal, good deal. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, my next question uh, for a voter, uh, under this voting topic, it, it's going uh, to it's open to all all panelists, uh, but I definitely want to, to focus on Cora um, and Cranston. Cranston, correct? Cranston. Cranston. And, and I want you all to, to, to give a comment on um, as someone who votes, like who, who's at the ballot, whether it's early voting, whether it is voting the day of. Why do you? Why are you all engaged in that process? Why is it important for our community? And what should we do in the, on November 3rd to ensure that uh, we, we are exercising our right to vote? So the reason that I stepped up in this realm, and especially with Dallas County and Democrats, is because I realized that I had a huge advantage with my family, mm -hmm. right? So everybody knows the blacks are active in this political realm. Not only that, but I've had the secret weapon of Trey Black. Mm -hmm. Trey Black, every single time I have voted since I was 18 years old, there you go. has given me a cheat sheet of, let me tell you who's for you, let me tell you who's not for you. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you who's progressing black people, let me tell you who's not. I realized folks didn't have that. People don't have that in their families, in their networks to say, hey, you can, let me minimize the list for you. So that has been one of my largest initiatives in DCYD is meeting people where they are. When I was 18, I didn't have the knowledge and, or the desire to research every single candidate on every ballot every election, especially when it comes to municipal elections, right? Because it can feel like there's a clown card, right? They always, it's always a clown card election somewhere. Um, and it's one of those things, meeting people where they are, making sure that people have the resources they need in order to understand how things directly affect their lives. You made a really good point with RBG. We lost a good one. She minimized the strife of women and black women in the workplace. That can be reversed. You have 33% of the workforce currently saying their workplace does not allow discussion around racial injustice and racial inequalities. Those are the things RBG fought for. Yes. We need another person in that position to move it forward. That affects your life. There's one in five people that have left their jobs in 2019 because there was a lack of culture fit. What do you think that means? What do you think that means for black people? What do you think that means for women? What do you think that means for black single mothers? That culture fit is about us. That's not other ethnicities, it's not your average white person saying, oh, I don't like it here. That's us. So, you know, that's me coming from my also HR perspective. <laughs> there is, it, you know, it, but those are the things that politics is gonna have to meet people where they are. Work is one of those things, one of those environments. Just you said in real estate, you see, you see how in your field, how politics directly affects. Same in HR. Yeah. Talk a little bit more about how, especially in Texas, in real estate, 
And in politics, you said, uh, Corey, thanks for all the work that you're doing with Texas Democrats. Shouts out to Trey Black for, for recruiting his sister to continue, continue the Black legacy um, in that. Uh, but talk to us more about, particularly in a historically red state in these last 30 years or so, um, being an African American in this space and, and exercising the right to vote. Absolutely. Um, Any time that I step up to the ballot box, as I said earlier, I think about those that, that came before me and, and all the blood, sweat, tears, lives that were given, and I go in to be able to cast that, that ballot. <clears throat> I mean, with, with Texas, it's, it's been a, a red state, so you have um, a, a lot of blue areas. Like, personally, I, I was actually born down in the capital city. I was born down in Austin, but then I went to Prairie View, then I moved to Dallas. But a lot of the counties are blue. So, you know, it was under the last election, people were trying to say, oh, maybe Texas can go purple or however, or it kind of was purple. But we have the Texas two-step process. So you're talking about uh, one thing, uh, Matt, you mentioned about Texas specifically. Other states may have it, but we have here the Texas two-step. You know, it's kind of like what we call it, where you have to go and vote and then you have to caucus. And so, yeah. you know, we, we make sure that we go through that entire process to make sure that each particular ballot is counted and make sure that your voice is heard through the vote. Because as many of the panelists have said, all politics is generally local. I started out here back when uh, Mr. Don Hicks that used to be on, on the city council a long, long time ago. I helped in races that he was running and I helped in many campaigns here and I saw that with those that are in politics and then being in business, I realized politics is really about the distribution of wealth of a particular country, state, city, you know, and that's, that's what it is. Even down to an HOA, which is a small little political system of, um, of neighborhood. Politics is about the distribution of that wealth, but then also about the management of it. And so there's many things when I was First coming in, I came into the commercial real estate um, part of the business, and I saw that while certain people were getting contracts, other people weren't getting contracts. And then I saw how the quote-unquote, um, I, I know Ms. Black just spoke about the, the you know, understanding and having a cheat card. I saw through people that were my mentors, I saw where they gave me kind of a cheat card to be able to say, hey, with this so-called like minority thing, we need to make sure that there's some ethnic minority. And so while so many times blacks, you know, we get lumped into everyone else, into multicultural, into minority, if you look at a lot of those amendments to the Constitution, that was for us. And that's not, you know, trying to uh, pat ourselves on the back or stick our chest out. That's just to deal with the reality. No knock on any other people. I lived and went to high school in Okinawa, Japan. So I've been around and seen other cultures have a great respect for them. But when I look at those amendments to the Constitution of the United States where I live, I say those things were meant for us. And what I see is a bunch of people that are coming over and they're basically utilizing those amendments that were meant for us. And so it's kind of like anything else. Say if you got a big, beautiful house like that we're in and you just don't know the value of it and you say, well, you know, I'll sell it for maybe, you know, $100 or whatever. It's like, well, you know, you wouldn't do that. You know, you don't know the value of something, so we have to be able to look at our Constitution. You can walk around, I used to walk around with a little pocketbook of it uh, that I learned from this elder to be able to understand and know the Constitution, that rule that guides where we live mm -hmm. and understand those amendments and how powerful they are and be able to utilize them to our benefit just as many other people do. So I think about all of that goes into this head when I step into that, that voting group. That's great. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. And, and you actually brought up a really interesting um, point in terms of identifying vote as power. Like, the vote is powerful. And what happens whenever there's something that's powerful, there's going to be systems that try to circumvent it to, for them to selfishly use and abuse that power. In this society, one of those avenues is voter suppression. Voter suppression is a real thing. It's a real strategic way for people to discourage others from voting. If we talk in a partisan manner, it's a way where one party specifically um, use different initiatives to uh, prevent another uh, groups of people who support a separate party to vote for that particular their particular candidate in. 
Why am I saying this in generality? Because this is not a partisan per, per se conversation, but there, there, is, there are no um, disputes with facts in this country. Texas is one of nine states that has the strictest voter um, laws in the country. That's by design. Um, there are things um, that have been placed here um, and not only in Texas but in other states in the country to discourage people from voting. And so I would like uh, Lorraine uh, to, if you can, talk to us a little bit about some examples of voting, uh, of, of voter suppression. There's gerrymandering, there are the use of ID cards. Historically, there was the, the, the poll tax. Uh, could you talk to us a little bit more about uh, the 2020 version of voter suppression locally, but also in the state of Texas? Absolutely. So I'll give you a short version of an example. Um, there is a constituent, her name is Vera Trotter. She had to take four trips to vote. She doesn't drive anymore. Um, she had a fall, so she was in the process of rehabilitating um, her movement, um, her ability to, to get around on her own. So the first time she went to go vote, and she used to vote with her mother who paid the poll tax, so she took voting very seriously. The first time she went to go vote, uh, this was when Texas voter ID was still the law. She was denied this parent drive. She had to get a ride to try to go vote that first time. The second ride, she took that expired ID to the Texas Department of Public Safety to get an accessible ID with the old expired one. They accepted that at the DPS office, but would not accept it at the poll. She went from the uh, from there on the third trip, now from her home at that for the piece of paper from DPS to the polling location, where they issued her a provisional ballot. She still had not cast the proper ballot, even though she had the proper documentation. So her fourth trip that she had to get a ride for was from there to the elections department to validate her provisional ballot. And so the question is, how many verifiers are out there? We know that most people if they get turned away once at the poll, that's enough for them not to vote, let alone someone who has the fortitude and the time, frankly. And she was retired. But a lot of people who are working, they're not in the position to take time off of work for four different days to make sure that their vote gets cast. And so we must be doing everything we can to ensure that every eligible voter has the right to vote in their vote county. And that is a version, a short version of what voter suppression can look like. Another gentleman uh, that I was, uh, that I had the acquaintance to know, he was off paper. And we went to, the, you know, the top polling location um, in Southern Dallas, Beckley, Oakland, up Courthouse. Mm -hmm. And the judge there, who worked there for a number of years, a lot of people know her, um, he, he was denied the franchise. And he was eligible to vote. Um, and so we had to have a conversation, you know, we went in there, we explained, you know, what the actual law was regarding voter ID. Um, eventually we had the elections administrator on the phone, he was able to cast the ballot. But these are concrete examples of what voter suppression looks like, and it is a real thing. Um, there's a lot of confusion out there, for example, because Crystal Mason, a lot of people might know her case, where she believed that she qualified to vote, she thought she was off paper, and she was sent up to five years in jail for trying to vote. She didn't even cast a regular ballot. And so that's what it looks like. Um, but we have to keep fighting. For example, uh, I was one of the interveners on the lawsuit that stopped voter ID from being implemented that allows people to still vote with a voter registration card. A lot of people in Texas don't know that they can still vote with that. And so we, together, all of us that are on this panel, I know we're all going to be doing everything we can to make sure people know how to vote, especially in this very election coming up. Thank you for that, and I, I and you you actually you brought up a, a great segue. You, you took us to a great segue to close out on our voting component. Um, would you tell us some ways we can prevent voters uh, voter fraud or voter suppression um, to to discuss? How sorry. How can we not allow voter suppression to discourage us from voting? I'll ask you first, and then I would like Taylor to respond to give his viewpoint from Forward Club, 
and then everyone else on the panel. Yes, yeah, so the first thing we can do is logging on to your relevant election authority. If you live in Dallas County, go on DallasCountyVotes.org. You can actually look up your current registration status. The deadline to register for this upcoming election is the this, so if you have not registered, please vote. But one of the things, while we're talking about voter suppression and why you always want to double check your status, unfortunately, we have a you know, history in our state of one party felt leadership for the most part, and we know that they have purged voter rolls. We know that every election, thousands of people in our state get purged for a variety of reasons that many of us believe are illegitimate. And so there are people that we talk to every year, every election, that find out after the registration deadline that they have been heard. So I ask every person in the community, go on there, log on, check your status. Even if you're not online, you can call the elections department and they will check it for you. And as long as you register by the deadline, you can still vote in this election. Thanks, Laura. Um, I think it's also really important to add uh, one thing that we're doing at DCYD is honoring a buddy system. If you encourage 10 of your friends and ask those 10 friends to then have some accountability, be an accountability coach of saying, hey, check in. I, went, I voted. Did y'all vote? Do, that, do a group text to 10 people. Have them do 10 more and then 10 more and then 10 more um it then has exponential growth of voting there are things like flipping the texas house we have a meeting coming up for dcyd for october membership meeting it takes the two people that we have at our meeting brandy chambers joanna cadnack to flip the Texas house. <laughs> so it's not this, you know, huge, great, oh, it, it's going to take all this effort. No, it's those two people mm -hmm. in order to flip the Texas house blue. That's huge. Yeah. That's huge. And, you know, that's the types of things that we're really going to have to focus on. Thank you, Corey. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to add before I do final comments on voting? Uh, on voter suppression, mm -hmm. we have to be aware, and if it doesn't make sense, question it. You know, if you're not 100% sure, question it. There was a piece on, um, I think it was Rachel the other night, where, or I saw it on the internet, I can't remember where I got the information from, but people were calling in. It was on Rachel because the two guys they traced it back and um, they were arrested. But they were calling in, telling them uh, that about their vote. Mm. You know whether or not they could actually vote if they had longer to vote. And the president said this the other day, I don't know how many people caught this, but he said when you turn in your ballot, you have until the 10th of November for that ballot to be valid. That's not true. Not true for good. It's not true. Yeah. So if it doesn't yeah. make sense, you've known, well, the younger people may not know, and that's what this is about. Mm -hmm. But for older people, when you get those robocalls, you know that the first Tuesday of every presidential voting year is it. Mm -hmm. Is it. You don't get a chance to vote after that. Right. That's it. Right. And right. Mm -hmm. right. You and vote, vote early. And, and, and one thing that he's doing, one thing that the president was saying to confuse people is that particularly this year where there are going to be a record number of bail-in ballots, you only have that up until November 3rd to vote, but they have the amount of time to count the votes. So we may not know who wins on November 3rd. It may take a couple of weeks. That's going to be called, I want to say it's called a political lag. That is what's factual. But when he says that, and people think, 
we we have until November 10th to vote. No. That's discouraging people. Because you have that ballot has to have a postmark. A postmark by November. Actually, the mail-in ballot needs to be, it needs to be postmarked. Yeah, postmarked by November 3rd. Right. So it vote. has to have a postmark on it. And um, the we our ancestors fought for us to have the right. Mm -hmm. They were kicked, beaten. All that other stuff does have us the right to vote. And for those of us in our generation, like me and the videographer, we remember, I remember exactly my mom taking me to vote with her. And she had to take a test. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we paid our dues not to have to do that anymore. That voter intimidation is, you know, it's illegal. It's, you cannot do that anymore. And it's okay to tell. But, you know, I, what frightens me so badly about this voter intimidation is that we are new age, new generation black folks. We don't, we don't lay down and roll over anymore. And I don't want to see the bloodshed. So vote early. Mm -hmm. and, and if you go there, avoid trouble like the plague. If you see a lot of people in Texas hanging around with those uh, Confederate signs or vote some oppression uh, type gear, in Texas you can vote in any precinct. Mm -hmm. Go to a number one. You but know, vote. avoid that. But vote. That's very important. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Vote. Vote, vote. Now, the last day, we said this earlier in our, in our discussion, the last day to register to vote is October the 5th. You have to post, have a postmark letter to request your registration by October 5th. You can look online, but you cannot register online. You have to register via paper. So register, look for someone who can register you to be I rest you to vote and postmark by November 5th. Another other important dates. Absentee ballot voting de uh, deadlines. The request an absentee ballot, the deadline is October 23rd. October 23rd is the last day you can request uh, mail-in ballot. It needs to be returned by mail and postmarked by November 3rd. In-person voting. Um, early voting starts October 13th through October 30th. Um, the dates and the hours may vary based on where you live in the country. Please go to Dallas County Votes. Um, I believe that we said that earlier in the broadcast to find uh, other information. But also know, just as you said, Ms. Dennis, you can vote anywhere um, in this election. If you feel uncomfortable voting in your neighborhood precinct, Go somewhere else to vote. Vote early. Practice safe distancing. And if you're even uncomfortable with that, do a mail-in absentee ballot voting. All right? Now, if you're going to do the mail-in absentee ballot, if you put a regular first-class stamp on it, that ballot would travel as first-class mail. Mm -hmm. It won't go both with the uh, mail-in ballots. So you can do that as well, you know. Yeah. So to expedite the travel, because that's going to play a part, a crucial part in this election this year, especially with COVID, and that's that's our next subject matter uh, we're going we're going towards. We've had mail-in ballots through our history of our country, if you that there, but this season, this pandemic, um, that that uh, started in this country was introduced in this country. At the very end of 2019, um, it was around December when we had the first cases, but we didn't start um, shutting down and practice precaution until the second full week of March of 2020. And that has crippled mobility in this country. So I want us to talk a little bit about COVID. Um, one, I want to give you all some background on COVID. COVID-19 is actually an acronym 
for the coronavirus disease of 2019. It was COVID-19 was discovered um, in China uh, around November of 2019, and its name was given by the World Health Organization on February the 11th, 2020, for the disease caused by the novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. This deadly disease started in Wuhan, China, in the late 19, 2019, November, and has since spread worldwide, affecting millions. In fact, this affected 33.4 million people worldwide, 7.16 uh, 7 million people in the United States, 771,000 people in the state of Texas. Now, out of those 33 million people that were that have that is total cased, one we've had one million deaths worldwide, while 23.2 million have recovered from this phase of COVID-19. Now, let's talk about the impacts of COVID. Taylor, um, I, I want to start with you. Um, it's been a while since you, you've spoken, but I want to. Taylor, are you still on? Or Lorraine, are you on? Lorraine is still on. I'm on. I'm not, uh, not sure if Taylor and uh, Katie are here. Okay. Lorraine, would you talk to us a little bit about COVID-19 and what your roles and responsibility as a public official has been? Because you've done amazing work in continuing to communicate uh, to your constituents during the season. Absolutely. So, you know, we chatted a little earlier about the responsibility in public service. And so, uh, for example, your tax, tax dollars um, allow for there to be staff at every uh, level of government to help with what's called case work. So a lot of times people think that if you're not in legislative session, there's no work going on. And that is, could be, could not be further from the truth if, the, if your elected official is actually doing their job. So, for example, um, I was sworn in pretty much right before the pandemic shut everything down. And I can tell you, we have had, you know, an innumerable, we can't even count the number of cases that we've had dealing with unemployment specifically. Um, dealing with, with housing. There are a lot of seniors who struggle with housing, and as you can imagine, because of the pandemic, the normal uh, means that we would use to get people placed in housing uh, were crippled because a lot of the senior living facilities were shut down. Yeah. And so, you know, we could go on down the line, access to care. People are afraid uh, to go and seek health care for their chronic conditions because they're afraid of contracting COVID. Um, but what we're also seeing is that because they're not taking care of themselves, that if for some reason they are exposed, their body is not uh, in good of a position to deal with it, um, to fight against that infection because they don't have the medications or they haven't been seeing their primary care physician. Yeah. And so um, it's really a crisis. And first of all, you know, I'm, I would be remiss if I said that uh, we feel like our state has been enough. Our state has not done enough. Um, and I think that's definitely to do with the government that we currently have. Um, we know that there wasn't enough testing. We know that there was not enough contact tracing. Uh, I've been on calls with the governor where there were things that he said that were just patently false. And really uh, moving along the drumbeat of, of the current uh, commander in chief. And so, again, I hate to keep harping on voting, but that is how we can change these things. But on an everyday basis, the crisis we're seeing people are having shortage of food, we're having food insecurity, access to care issues. Being able to live and pay their light bill because people have lost their jobs. And a lot of times when people lose their jobs, they lose their health insurance. So all these things are related, not to mention what struggling small businesses have seen. You know, obviously some of us have been doing what we can to connect people to funding um, opportunities. Um, but that, you know, all around, COVID has affected life and livelihood. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right, 1,000%. 
um, I want I want Princeton and, and Deborah uh, to 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 focus uh, on my next questions, and because both of y'all have been in in industry, in real estate, um, business owners, things of that nature, Corona the coronavirus has not only impacted us in our health, but in up in all facets of society, um, with the U.S. A being a capitalist society with a capitalist economy, um, COVID has affected specifically African American businesses and our livelihoods um, directly. Would you all talk to us a little bit about your viewpoints on this year and how that has affected our community? Sure. Um, as as far as the, like our specific business, and you know, of course, different industries get hit different ways. I remember uh, one of my favorite restaurants uh, that I would go to, uh, Sankofa, uh, that's right off of Camp Wisdom. Sir. I saw through the online, oh, we're having to close down. And, and so many businesses have been affected greatly by the business just because they, they don't have people that are coming out that feel safe to be able to even go out their home mm -hmm. when we are under the first lockdown. And so a lot of times when, well, but let me jump back to, to our business. Our business, it, it kind of had a weird effect, but this is how this economy, you spoke of a capitalistic system, this is kind of how it is. So our business, it kind of had a little spike for a minute because what happened is there were many people that had homes on the market and, and property, and they were like, oh, once COVID hit, they were like, whoa, we don't want a bunch of people coming in through our property because we don't know that, we don't know what they might have. So what happened is a bunch of properties came off of the market. Well, true to the market, uh, true to the concept of supply and demand, then it was like, not a lot of properties. So then, of course, prices went up. Right. But what's going to happen is, I mean, just you can look at it from, I don't have a crystal ball, but just understanding and being in this business almost 20 years, you can say, okay, that's going to last for a little while. But then, as, as uh, Lorena just spoke to, many people are losing their jobs. I seen yesterday on the news 32,000 32, airline employees furloughed, gone. So that's going to have a trickle-down effect. I remember that, uh, as, a, as Ms. Deborah Dennis would say, she's one of my realtors now, but I remember her before, this was maybe 15 years ago, and she said, you know, we ride off of the economy. Yeah. You know, we, our business is truly tied directly through the greater economy. And I said and thought about that, and I was like, that is the case. You know, because people, you figure, they buy houses all the time. But when you look at it and you're in the business, you start to see the net effect of, whoa, we really do ride this way of the economy. So it's it's had a little spike up right now. People are getting a little bit more comfortable with the PPE and everything. They're saying, okay, well, people can maybe come back into our home. But we understand that the market corrects itself. And so while we have a bullish market right now, we're kind of cringing for what's going to happen in 2021 because we were bullish before. And then we set back a little bit and got a lockdown, but people are still in the same mindset. We both were in the business when the crash came back in 08, and what happened is the confidence of people, and I'll say that again, the confidence of people got shaky. And see, COVID, it's going to start to affect that confidence, and when you do that, then that's when you have a bigger problem on your hand because not only are people not going out because they're scared to go out because they don't want to get this particular virus and disease, but then they're like, whoa, we don't know what's going to happen, so we better pull our purses and, and close them up a little bit. Right. And that's when you can have a catastrophic results, you know. Sorry. Great point. Ms. Dennis? And one of the things that you, you have to be cognizant of is the market. Right. Mm -hmm. And you have to anticipate with all of these people being laid off, not being able to pay their mortgages mm -hmm. or their rent mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the landlord probably has a notice well. Absolutely. And if they're not collecting rent, they can't pay their note, yep. it's going to be a lot of foreclosures. Right. A lot of houses are going to go into foreclosure. Right. And a lot of people, and I like to say there's a, a, there's a blessing in every tragedy. It's going to be a tragedy for those who are caught up in it and have to move and have to lose. But it's going to be a blessing for the investor. Mm -hmm. So you, you, have to, um, you have to anticipate what's going to happen and be ready for it. Now, Cranston and I both were back there in 2007, from 2006 to 2008 when that market crashed, and everybody who was underneath it fell right. when the bubble burst. 
but you learn from your mistakes. Absolutely. And you learn, you have to analyze what happened then, and you don't want to make those same mistakes again. Exactly. So COVID-19 is, uh, is very serious. We need to uh, look at the ramifications of the disease on all aspects of life and livelihood. And you can't take anything for granted. You, you have to trust the science. Yeah, you trust the science, not the spoken word. You trust the science. And you have to react to the science to protect yourself. Because if COVID-19 can infiltrate the White House mm -hmm. with all of the protections and precautions that they have going on over there, nobody's safe. Right. Nobody's safe. And you have to uh, you have to be prepared for the worst. Really, you have to be prepared for the worst with COVID-19. You be prepared for the worst and you pray that you never have to enact the preparation that you have in place. Because, um, you know, it's just, a, it's just a deadly disease out there. And personally, I think it's uh, institutional and systematic uh, systemic racism, you know, because that disease disproportionately affects African Americans and people of color, right. but mostly us. You know, uh, the essential workers, we're, the, we're that essential worker, you know. We have to work in the, uh, most of, we don't have to do it, but most of us have the jobs at the fast food restaurant and places like that, or at the hospitals, the gen you know, the wheels have to keep turning. Even if the hospital's post open, mm -hmm. the post office, uh, the janitorial service. Things that make so, the country go around. Things that make the country go around. We are the ones that normally have those particular jobs. We are the essential worker. Mm -hmm. So you have to be prepared and protect yourself because uh, COVID-19 is real. Agreed. As you said, yeah, I, I was just, just going to say when uh, when I heard that Dennis talking about the the mortgage part of it and just the business, they they had a uh, I think it was on NPR. I was listening to the other day, and they were saying right now, right now, one in every four mortgages in the United States has has had some sort of trouble since COVID. That's twenty five percent. That's actually they said more than it was when the Great Recession happened. Yeah. They said it, it wasn't there then. So they said one in every four because, as, as she just alluded to, this is hitting people on all different levels. I, I had a friend that's, that's a strict vegan, vegetarian. This is one of the healthiest gentlemen I know. He does uh, jujitsu and other stuff like that. And he called me like, man, I, I've been sick for like three weeks. He wasn't deathly ill for the three weeks. He said that was for the first week uh, that he just, you know, just felt like, oh, man, like, I, I, I hope I'm going to make it. And then he started to come out of it. And then it, this was back in July. And he texted me uh, in August. It was right, uh, like, second week of August, I think. And he said, man, I'm, uh, I got my results back. And, and, and I'm, I'm negative. You know, I don't, I don't want to have it anymore. And so I'm saying, yeah, it's, it's real. A lot of people, I think they thought it was a hoax. My, my sister actually was a school teacher over in China. And when it first started there, I remember texting her saying, hey, you know, this was like a second star. Was something you all OK over there? And she was traveling around and like, oh, you know, we fine. And what happened is they have a, the Chinese New Year starts in uh, January 31st. Right. And she wound up getting caught in Singapore. And they were saying, oh, no, um, if you just came from China, no, you're, you're going to have to quarantine for 14 okay. days. So, they, so she said, well, no, I'm not doing that. I'll just, you know, go, go to Thailand. So then she went to Ch Thailand because uh, flying is cheap over there. She just went place to place. And Thailand said, oh, no, you, same thing. You, know, you just came from China. Oh, you got to quarantine 14 days. She wound up just saying, you know what, forget it. Um, no country will let me back in. China told her, oh, no, you've been gone. No, nah, we can't let you back in because you're not assisting it. She has to just go ahead and come back to the United States. And she's been here waiting to get her assignment back wow. in China. Wow. So, I mean, it's, it's affecting people on all different levels all throughout the globe. And so uh, yeah. it's a real disease. It's, it's affecting us. us. And, it's, and it's affecting not only every citizen, mm -hmm. but black people from across the diaspora. Absolutely. And it's, like you said, Ms. Dennis, it's, it's disproportionately affecting us more. 42% um, of black businesses have shut their doors permanently due to COVID-19 statistics. Wow. And so 
That's not a temporary, you know, we want to take a hiatus. No, they've shut their club, they've shut their doors. Mm. This is a, and when you have economic ecosystems not being able to support their communities, that affects other facets. That affects um, people work for them, people who are working for those type of companies. Mm -hmm. It affects education. It affects our leadership because our political, our civic leaders, all of those people who are public servants need to have an economic base so that they can do their work as well. And when that's compromised, that can affect their effectiveness. Mm -hmm. um, loss of income. And it stre stretches the poverty and income inequalities we have in this country. Mm -hmm. One thing that we, I want to stress, state before we go to the last subject briefly is that black, the black community have dealt with issues pre and post COVID. Absolutely. This is the same thing. We have to continue to find a solution. This is not a short term fix. Once this pandemic ends, that doesn't mean we are going back to normal. Exactly. Right. We yeah. have to ensure that we create systems and we are voting and we're putting the right people in place so that our communities can have a shot post COVID. That's my that's my public service announcement. <laughs> I want to state one more thing. I want to talk about the Supreme Court justice before. Oh, we can I say something? Yes. Uh, we have a couple minutes, Ms. Thomas. We have okay. two minutes. Even though we're in the midst of COVID nineteen, we still have to vote. Yes. We still got to go out there and vote, and uh, you have to judge the risk of voting in person. Yes. And if you can't get it in person, then you have to go to the uh, alternative methods like the the, the mail-in ballots or the absentee ballot. But use you've got PPE. to vote. Yeah, use your PPE. Use you know, your PPE. Mm -hmm. um, when you go, if you're going to wait till the last minute to go, be prepared to stand in those long lines. That's but right. you've got to go vote. Vote early if you can, too, if you want to go face to face. Vote early if you can't start on October 13th. And you have to, if you're going to stand in that line, make sure, protect yourself. Make sure you have your mask, your sanitizer, your water, etc. I like to see them put, uh, those lines are so long, and I brought it up in my Sunday school class that I was concerned about the topic because, you know, a lot of women out there, right. uh, you know, it, it's, it's a known fact that we need more bathroom resources than... Right. Then mm -hmm. men, I like to see them put porta parties out there, but they say they let you go in the building. Well, if the line is, is wrapped around the block yeah. and you have to go into the building, you know, then that means you got to walk out of that building and walk back to your spot. That's very true. So uh, I like to see them do something creative like that. But vote. Everything boils down to the vote because when we vote, if we change vote down the line, local and federal, mm -hmm. you can change a lot of that with the people that you put into office. Mm -hmm. And that's the point that, another point that we wanted to make to the young people, you've got to get out and vote. And, you, and like uh, Cora said, you have to uh, create a, a system where if you take 10 people, tell them to take to notify 10 people and create an, ex, an exponential uh, turnout. Yeah, agreed. That's actually, I actually want, that's a great segue, a great way to close. Um, vote, vote, vote. Voting is important. Voting is essential. Why is voting essential? Because we are living in a republic where representation matters. When we have representation of our community in these halls, we're able locally, state, and federally, we're able to um, address needs and the issues and provide a blueprint so that our business leaders, our education leaders, our, our leaders within our communities can thrive so that we can have the best um, outcome for us. Uh, I want to thank you all for an amazing uh, discussion. I want this to happen again. I want to uh, have a special shout out to our videographer, 
C.W. Whitaker, thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you for um, promoting this on your TV channel. Um, it's virt it's going to be online. It's on what channel are we on, C.W.? CFN. CFN, um, and, and that's an amazing network. I've done some things with them. Um, Deborah Dennis, Miss Deborah, thank you for, for providing this space so that we can educate our community. Absolutely. Thank you very much for opening your house. Um, thank you for your passion for our community. Absolutely. Also, I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank um, Ms. Lorraine. Lur thank you very much for your feedback. I'd like to thank Taylor Toins. Um, Princeton, thank you, sir, for, for your comments and feedback. I also want to thank um, Ms. Cora Black uh, with uh, Dallas County Democrats. Thank you all, and see you all. Oh, and I want to give a shout out. What's your name, Chief? I'm Joseph Rogers. Joseph? Joseph Roberts? Rogers. Rogers. Were you formerly at Prairie View at one point? Uh, no, sir. I go to University of Houston. Oh, you're, you're a vet. You're a cougar. Yes, sir. All right. All right. Thank you for coming out and helping out. Um, we are all a community. Thank you all. Go vote. November 3rd, early vote, early vote starts October 13th. Thank you. Have a good evening.